There we are. Hello. Hello. Oh, I should put some headphones on. I'm always such a whiner about people putting their headphones on, and yet... I You're always mine. the last I one. I am always the last one, yeah. Keeps me tied down. I want to be able to move around. So That's what Bluetooth is for. Oh, you trust Bluetooth? You're crazy. Oh, not to record, but to listen, yeah. Mm, yeah, I know. I love those Bluetooth he headphones. Um, so where where are you still? I am still in Lisbon, Portugal. And uh, it's it's a city that's infested with castles. And Not a would, city. Well, it's a city infested. It's also a country, a country infested, infested with castles. But they don't have proper walls. I believe that's what you were noting, that a, in their well, mind a castle is just a great big crazy building? So so I kept seeing things that I'd call castles and I'd be told, no, 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 that's not a castle that doesn't have walls. And so finally they started taking me to actual castles with walls and villages within the walls and everything else. And um, no, there, there are many castles here. There just happen to be more palaces than castles. So I'm, I'm slowly getting um, indoctrinated into this whole what is a castle culture. You come, you'll come back an expert. Now, you're, how long are you in Portugal for, and then what, what's next? So I leave Por Portugal this weekend, and I'm going uh, via Athens, Greece, to uh, Volos for the Global Hands-On Universe uh, workshop, and the, oh, there's three sets of teacher training associated with it, and we're going to go say hi and talk to the kids at the European uh, Astronomy Science Olympiad. Um, so it's a whole lot of sharing with colleagues, training teachers, talking to students. We're, we're here to be a force of nature for the good of science. And when are you back home? I finally come home August 7th and I'll be home for I think like two and a half weeks before taking off to Dragon Con. Right. And I'm going to be at PAX this year. And it looks like right after that I'm actually going to be going to New Zealand and Australia and details for that will follow. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, a little jealous. All right. Um, okay, so if you have no idea what you have stumbled into, we are going to be recording a live episode of Astronomy Cast. We're going to be doing episode 313, Procession. Uh, we're a couple of weeks behind, but not too bad. I'm all right with this. Um, and then we're going to, uh, we're going to record uh, another episode after this, probably. So, um, which is going to be on acceleration. So we're going to do an episode on procession right now, and then we'll probably sort of shut the whole machine down and then start it back up again and, set, and start a new hangout, and we'll do acceleration, you know, with maybe a half an hour break in between. So, uh, uh, No break, because I want to eat dinner. No eating? No, we have to, okay, no break, but we have to, we have to slice it up. So, um, yeah. so we, have to, we have to shut this down and then start up a new hangout so that we can get a separate file. So anyway. Right. That's it. Um, five also, minutes, five yeah. minutes in between. And if you're watching this live, or if you're watching this, if you're watching this live, subscribe. And if you're watching this after the fact, also subscribe. Uh, and especially go to Astrosphere Vids, which is our big YouTube channel that has all of the stuff that CosmoQuest does. And then make sure you subscribe to that one because you've got all of this. You've got the virtual star parties. You've got the weekly space hangouts. You've got the learning space. So much great space stuff. So. Okay, um, are you ready to record? Oh, and I, oh, you can talk to us uh, while we're doing this episode. Um, so you can post a comment or question on YouTube, on Google+, on tw well, Twitter's kind of hard for us to find. Just do, just do YouTube. I'm not even going to tell you all the different places. Just just click on watch this video on YouTube and ask your comment question there because our comment tracking machine is... is has gotten very fragmented and very difficult to track all these comments on all these different locations. So uh, I know you're going to want to instinctually just type wherever you see a box and just like hope that someone sees it, but chances are we won't see it unless you do it on YouTube or I'm watching eight different pages at the same time. So uh, Pamela might watch Twitter. I won't. No, I, I am right now I have everything turned off so that the internet gods do not Fuck. lag us by 20 seconds. Okay, all right, focus, focus. Uh, okay, cool. All right, so you're ready to go on mono? Yes. Okay. I am not at mono. <laughs> what microphone is it using? That's the real question. 
It sounds good. Yeah, so I know that that Skype is using the correct thing. We're not using Skype. I know that Google Plus is using the right thing. That's right. Okay. Love Google Plus. Thank you, Google. <laughs> okay. So now GarageBand is still using. Okay, GarageBand is now happy. Okay, good. I am pressing record. I am also pressing record. It is recording. It is also recording here. Here we go. Astronomy Cast, episode 313 for Monday, July 1st, 2013. Procession. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? Good, and where are you? I am in Lisbon, Portugal. And when do you leave there? I am here until the weekend, and then I go to Athens, Greece, and then to Volos, Greece, and I finally go back to the United States on August 7th. So this is an epic 35-day trip of collaboration, communication, and science education. Go space. Go space. Um, but if people want to hang out with you, uh, where's the next big opportunity? DragonCon? Oh. Uh, DragonCon in the United States, and if anyone wants to see me in Volos, Greece, we're going to be doing a bunch of different events. Just drop me a note over on Google+, and we can set up a time. We're doing a giant science cafe that once I understand all of the logistics, I will post about, and you're all welcome at the science cafe. That's going to be in the village of Millie's, Greece, at a big cathedral, and um, yeah. It's all good. Cool. Uh, and I want to remind everybody that the Perseid Meteor Shower is coming up August 11th, 2013, and there's going to be no moon. So it's going to be a really great, you know, version of the Meteor Shower. So if you haven't already, set some time aside, gather some friends, get organized. Get bug spray. Get bug spray and, you know, plan to go somewhere nice and dark and far from the city light and really enjoy this this show because it's just terrific. And I with no and moon, it's such a treat. I think call that the backyard. The backyard. Well, for me it is, yeah. I live in, I, there's the dark sky maps. Have you ever seen this? You can go, you can, yeah. you can find out sort of what area you live in. And so if you live in L.A., you live in the red area and then yeah. orange and yellow and green. So I'm right on the edge of yellow and green, just my backyard. And then I can drive yeah. 10 minutes and be in the the black, the no light pollution, which is great. So, um, but but you'll want to go and find one of these dark sky finders. Now, I've put an event on Google Plus. So if you just go and just like click yes, then you'll get a reminder to to do it. So if just look for events, search for Perseids, and you should find that event, and just click yes. And then you get a reminder in your calendar, and and then you'll and start organizing your your friends to go on the trip. So just one night. It's not going to kill there you, and you'll love it. There will be astrophotography involved on my end. Yeah, yeah, me too. Absolutely. Um, actually, even video. We're going to try and actually record us enjoying it. So, All right, here we go. Uh, so the Earth is wobbling on its axis like a top. You can't feel it, but it's happening. And over long periods of time, these wobbles shift our calendars around, move the stars from where they're supposed to be, and maybe even mess with our climate. Thank you very much, Procession. Uh, okay, so let's talk about the physics of this, and you always sort of relate it to a a wobbling top, a wobbling gyroscope. Right. So, so if I want to imagine precession in my brain, what am I looking at? What you are looking at is the uneven torque on the Earth due to gravity. So, with with a top, you you have this situation where you have an object that's not perfectly round that is spinning, and if it gets even the slightest bit not completely perpendicular to the force of gravity, it's going to end up with more gravity pulling on one side, the side that's closer to the Earth, the side that's tilted over, than is pulling down on the side that's off-axis. So it's, it's going to get this uneven tilt that, for the most part, is parallel to its rotational axis. Well, with the Earth, it's slightly different. You, you have that same slight tilt. We call it the tilt of the planet, the axial tilt. But in the case of the planet Earth, the gravity from the sun, which is almost perpendicular to the direction of the tilt, is on the side that's closer to the Earth, 
pulling a little bit harder on the side that's tilted away from the Earth, pulling a little bit less, but it's nonetheless pulling on this not round planet where what's called an oblate sphere, a flattened sphere. If we were a perfect circle, this wouldn't be an issue. It's because we're flattened about our axis of rotation and because we're rotating at a tilt that gravity gets the better of us and just ever so slowly, slowly rotates the tilt of the planet. Okay, so I'm going to imagine, I'm going to take my gyroscope, and they're awesome. If you don't own a gyroscope, and if you have kids, get a gyroscope because they're awesome. Um, and, you know, you pull that string, and the gyroscope is whizzling around, yeah. and then it's perfect. For a little while there, it's just perfectly up, straight up and down. As Nothing's... far as your eyes can see, and your eyes are not an accurate scientific device. Right, right, okay. But from what I can, yeah, from what you can see, it's perfect. And then as the gyroscope starts to slow down a little, you start to get this wobble of, you know, the, the top axis is starting to form a little circle in the air. And then as the gyroscope slows down, that wobble gets bigger. And it's almost like the wobble is starting to affect the gyroscope, or maybe it's just because it's slowing down, and then it just goes, like, completely out of control and then flops over on the side. So, and so this, in, in the case of the gyroscope, it's the gravity pulling it down, and you're saying in the case of the solar system, it's the sun pulling at it from, from the side. The side. Yeah, and you're, and you're in either this. case, it's tilted re relative to the force, so you end up with an unequal force, and it's that unequal force on the two sides of this tilted world, or the tilted top, or the tilted gyroscope, that causes that precession of the, the rotational axes. Does the moon have any impact on the precession? It, it's one of the things that, that it has a force that's almost perpendicular to rotation. The, the moon's orbit through the sky is very similar to the sun's. It's just rotated five degrees off of the sun's. So, um, yeah, those two forces are, are both out there pulling away on the planet Earth. So let's, let's imagine that we're looking down at the Earth from above. And we're, you know, the... Obviously, the, we're going to see the Earth spinning around and around and around in a, what, counterclockwise direction. But what about that procession? If we could sort of speed up the process, what would we see the Earth doing as we're looking down at it? So, so you're asking me to reverse the way I always think of it. Oh, okay. Um, so, so here we are on the Earth, and, and the way to think of it is as we look at the stars, they appear to move in a retrograde motion, slowly moving from west to east relative to, to where we'd expect them to be um, over the course of time. And they're moving about 50 arc seconds a year. How much is 50 arc seconds a year? That's not much. Well, it, it adds up to one full degree of motion uh, every 72 years, so it adds up fairly quickly. That means that in one normal human lifetime, all of the stars move twice the diameter of the moon across the sky. Like, permanently? Like, well, like, it, like, it, the, I mean, for 25,772 years. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, <laughs> I mean, but I mean, that's kind of, it's funny. Like when I was in high school, well, we'll get to this in a second, right? Because, you know, this has a real impact on the on the seasons. Yeah. But when I was in high school and sort of the, we went, got to the point of procession and I, and I was sort of understood the effect of procession, I was like doing the math and I was like, in my lifetime, the seasons will have shifted. Not uh, a lot. Not a lot, but you know, but a little bit. And it was yeah. for me that was that was kind of mind blowing. And I thought, you know, if you think about my grandparents' generation, you know, and the, yeah. the future generations, after a while, the longest day of the year, the hot, you know, these will all move. So, so let's talk about that then. So you talked about the stars, and the stars are moving, you know, a couple of degrees over, you know, a human lifetime. Well, um, a degreeish. A degree, yeah, yeah. yeah. What about the seasons? What about the days of the year? Well, so so along with this, if you think about it, what what's happening is we count our normal year based on how long it takes to get the stars back in the right place. So that's something that's very easy, very accurate to measure. But the other thing that we have to look at is how long does it take for the sun to go from straight over the equator to straight over the equator again to back straight over the equator to go one full cycle all the way north, all the way south, and then back. So when you look at that full one-year cycle, that's not quite the same as to line up with the stars. And, and this is where we see relative to the sun's position, the stars are moving those 50 arc seconds per year. 
and this causes with our calendar which is lined up with the stars this causes the the sun to to have its solstices to have its equinoxes gradually on a different date and if you look back through the calendars at the date that's marked as having the equinox you can watch over the course of a lifetime you figure one degree every 72 years that there's 365 days in a year, so there's basically one day in a lifetime that it all moves. And that was the math that I had come to. Yeah. Was that, you know, that the first day of summer would have shifted by one day in, in my lifetime. And that's kind of awesome to think yeah. about. Yeah, like and, I said, it, it blew my mind. And, and the thing that gets me about this is the discovery of the precession of the equinox is something that's that's been known since ancient times. Exactly how long it's been known, it's one of those things that, that historians love to argue over. There's, there's those who think that it was probably Hipparchus working probably a hundred years before Christ, two hundred years before Christ, figuring out when he was working on things. It was before Christ. It was a long time. Uh-oh. or Timocrates, one of these individuals that was out there and measuring very carefully what star was the sun lined up with on these different special days of the year. And um, to think that, well, back when we were basically still using sticks and geometry to measure everything before there was any sort of a clock more fancy than a, a water clock, they were measuring these one degree per hundred year type of, of changes in the sky. How on earth did they do that? Well, <laughs> it, it, the, the neat thing is you just measure um, what is the star the sun is closest to at sunrise and sunset. It's, I mean, it's, it's fancier than that, you, you clearly have to figure out, okay, sun is setting, what are the stars that you see as they light up, and there's math involved. It's a complex set of, of measurements, but by, by looking at sunset time and figuring out where things are relative to both sunset and sunrise, you can start to see how things move relative to those stars. That's that's amazing. I mean, you know, there's this idea that uh, I'm going to go down a rabbit hole for a second here. But there's this idea that that people always thought that the world was flat, but they really totally knew that it was a sphere for yeah. a long time, and the then Greeks just did. Yeah, and then just forgot. Yeah, the you know? dark ages happened. Yeah, uh, you know, but they had they had that figured out. They had calculated. Uh, not necessarily what distances to the moon, but at least they knew sort of percentages of like yeah. comparison between the distance of the moon and the distance of the sun, and they had this all figured out. Right. So, uh, yeah. Um, and and there, there's also some argued over um, archaeological indications that maybe the ancient Egyptians were aware of this as well and would tear down buildings when the alignments changed to fix the alignments. And, and the idea that you would tear a building down because the earth had rotated such that it was no longer collect correctly aligned with the stars, that's, that's a truly Egyptian historical thing to think about. Yeah. Now, okay, so the other consequence here is the North Star, right? So right now, our, the, the North Pole of the Earth is pointed essentially directly at the North Star, right. but as part of this process, we're gonna, that's going to shift away. Well, and, and also of use, the Southern Hemisphere is going to, to start to get its own pole stars. So, um, yeah, the really cool thing is Vega is actually going to be about five degrees off of being a pole star in uh, the year 14,000 AD. So we have a while to wait. I don't think you and I are probably going to be recording when that happens. I'll be on to my but... third robot body then, no problem. Um, but we are looking at a future where there is potentially going to be a much brighter pole star. Um, it, it turns out that about 3000 uh, eight, uh, 3000 BC, um, Thuban in uh, the constellation Draco was a pole star, but it was a much fainter pole star than even the North Star is, so uh, it would have been quite hard to see, but um, 
Yeah, all around the the circle of northern procession, we we have every few thousand years a halfway reasonable star to look to. Um, down in the southern hemisphere, they're choose your expletive, they're stuck. Um, they they don't really have a nice, happy, bright pole star to look to. Um, currently, there's really nothing, and uh, and and I mean nothing. Um, around zero A.D. B.C. Pick your way of n naming it. There was a star a little bit fainter than the North Star. Um, things are slowly migrating around 4,000 A.D. There's going to be another fainter star, but they just don't ever get any luck. Now, you know, there are other sort of movements I know that are kind of involved a bit with the Earth's orbit. So you have the situation where the, you know, the the the, the top of the Earth is rolling around like a top, but you also yeah. get this sort of a bit of a change in variation in its axial tilt as well, right? Um it so you have the axial tilt is slowly rotating around a mostly fixed point. So if you think of the way the top precesses, it's, it's precessing around a point. In this case, you have that same, it's precessing about a point. So yeah, you can, see, you can think of it as the axial tilt changing, but um, it's, it's all part of embedded cycles. So this entire thing that Whoa. it's rotating around yeah. Cycles within cycles. Right. Um, right. And I, and like I know it's not it's not related exactly to the procession, but you but you get the situation where the 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 wobble is happening and the sort of the tilt is changing a bit. And in fact, that's one of the with the tilt. That's one of the theories on on Mars that you know it's sort of quite significant. I mean, there's there's very strange right. oceans on Mars, you know, ancient oceans, and maybe it could have been a situation where the, the tilt completely changed over time. And and with Mars, it's actually a much more complicated situation. Here on Earth, we do have our moon to help stabilize us. Mars has two little captured asteroids that do a very sad job at stabilizing its tilt. And, and so when it gets torqued by Jupiter, when it undergoes influence from the sun, there's no extra body there to help stabilize those torques. So over time, its, it's inter gravitational interactions with the planets can have a much greater effect than the gravitational influences of other planets have here on Earth. Um, the moon is a dominant force for us, so Jupiter doesn't manage to get its hands on us quite so badly. Mars doesn't have the giant moon, and it's also closer to Jupiter, so it experiences more torque. Oh, it's good. I'm sort of going to move into that. So what about the other planets? So Mars, as we said, you know, experiences quite a lot of torque. What about Jupiter and the other the other planets? I mean, are they... Well, so, Uranus? <laughs> so... So when you start looking at those planets, those are much more flattened spheres. Um, and, and they do have, again, more precession. But... I, it, it's the type of thing where it's a much larger body and they're further from the sun, so um, you have less of a pull from the sun on them. They're harder to pull because they're much bigger, so the overall effect, it, it's not as dramatic as Mars. Mars definitely has the most dramatic effects of the planets that we worry about weather on. Now, let's talk a bit about climate because I think this is one of the things that the the global warming, climate change deniers will sort of jump on and go, well, you know, you've got this procession. And I, I guess, it, you know, there's a certain part of it that makes a little bit of sense in that, you know, we talk about how the, the Earth gets closer and further away from the sun at various points in its orbit, you know, whether it's at its aphelion or its perihelion yeah. point. Um, and right now, the southern hemisphere is the one that gets, is sort of, pointed, tilted towards the sun when the Earth is at its closest point of the sun, and so the southern hemisphere gets more heat. And you can imagine, yeah, you can imagine a situation where the, you know, 26,000 years from now, or whatever, or 13,000 years from now, the northern hemisphere will be the one that's getting that, that'll be the case, right? Right, so, so 13,000 years from now, right now it's, it's the first week of January is when we're closest to the sun, that's near winter, uh, solstice from the northern hemisphere. 
Um, so we get the most sun during our winter, which is during the southern hemisphere's summer, which causes the extremes between the seasons to be much greater for the southern hemisphere. Their winter is worse, their summers, they get more energy. Now, that is going to change over time, so the severity of the seasons will change over time. Um, Slight variations in, in alignments are also going to, to cause changes in glaciation patterns. But right now, I think the dominant concern that we have has nothing to do with precession, right. but rather it's the carbon in the atmosphere. Um, the, the last time there was this much carbon in the, astro in the atmosphere, it led to massive sea rises. And so there's, there's severe concern that um, Florida is about to get a lot smaller right. um, as Antarctica melts. But you would expect a situation where, you know, you would see the northern hemisphere warming up and the southern hemisphere would probably, you know, not get the, those variations. I guess the northern hemisphere would get those bigger variations. We'd get hotter summers, right. cooler winters, while the southern hemisphere would get milder winters and milder summers right. in relation to what it has now, but sort of overall across the entire planet it would just all balance out again. It balances out. Yeah. And these yeah. are such gradual processes. It, it takes basically 26,000 years for this cycle to complete, 25,722, for this, this cycle to complete, for the sun to return to lining up with the exact same set of stars on the sky. And, and over that roughly 26,000 years, um, our, our atmosphere can rebound from the slight changes. The glaciers are capable of picking up in one place and reforming through redeposition of the water um, in new places. This, this isn't normally an issue. It's when we change the atmosphere of our, our planet fundamentally that um, weather changes fundamentally. So is this procession changing over time? Has, you know, billions of years ago, was it different than what it is now? Well, it, there's all sorts of different effects at play. The fact that our continents are moving, the fact that, well, four billion years ago, we weren't exactly a solid object. Um, all of these things do have an effect. So when we talk about 25,722 years, that's ignoring the torques of the other planets. That's ignoring any effects due to the center of mass of the planet changing ever so slightly as those continents drift. The planet's movement moment of inertia, it, the uh, physics that controls how it responds to rotation, um, that changed when Japan had the severe earthquake a couple of years ago. It only changed a small amount, but it changed. Building of the giant da dam in China changed the moment of inertia of the Earth. All these different things change our rotation and change how we respond to different forms of torque. And um, it's, it's hard to make calculations that span millions and billions of years. I wonder if we'd want to do some geoengineering for a pointless reason. Could we slowly, carefully, by building gigantic structures and, you know, moving Earth around, sort of provide an opposite torque to sort of get our procession in order? I, I don't understand what you're trying to do to our poor planet. Just, I want to remove the procession. The procession just bothers me aesthetically, and I need it gone. Could you, I move need mass? To, you'd need to add 43 kilometers to to our north-south axes and then mm. change rotation, stop it, restart it, and, and that would kind of kill everything. But I, couldn't I just kind of tweak it a little every, every year, just a little more, move a little more mass so it sort of just balances out nicely? Well, so, so the problem is as long as the sucker's rotating, it's going to try and be an oblate sphere. Yeah, and as long as there's an oblate, oblate sphere, oblate spheroid, it's going to uh, get that uneven torque. Yep. <clears throat> I'm going to have to go after something that's a little more productive then, <laughs> then, then, then removing the procession from the yeah. from planet Earth. Well, that was great, Pamela. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Fraser. And stop, stop. record. Bye. You cut out there for a second on me. I'm sorry. It's okay. I, I, I'm very good at just pretending like you didn't.
<laughs> As people notice okay. that. Um, so, everyone, we are about to stop this Hangout and start a second Hangout to record a second episode, this time all about acceleration. So, do you um, want to hit stop broadcast and we can start this puppy all over again? I, I will need ten minutes in between. Ah! Okay. <laughs> are you that hungry? Um, well, it, folks went grocery shopping so I could record in peace. Oh, okay, all right. Uh, I just need to make sure my save is good. Okay. And then I'm going to lose all these questions, though. I don't think there were many. Can I just see if there's, like, a really compelling question here? Sure. Thanks. Uh, Katrina Inke says, maybe do a show on ancient society science. Fascinating about how the Greeks, Mayans, Egyptians do about astronomy. We did a history of astronomy. That. Yeah, we've done a history of astronomy show. Not sort of history of science, so. Uh, Churd Bud likes my... I'm trying. To, I'm not. I'm not trying to understand. Um, oh, never mind. Uh, Rod Mole asks, "Would life on Earth be different if we were not tilted at 23.5 degrees?" Yes. Yes, it would. Mm, yes, it would probably still be around, especially as the, long as there's a moon. We need the moon more than we need the tilt. Yeah, I mean, b bacterial life could withstand anything, but big life would have would not be happy. Why? Um, Oh, just temperature variations, that's all. I'm just thinking. Yeah, no, we'd be fine without seasons. Um, oh, yeah. It's like Hawaii. Uh, Churd Bud asks, doesn't these giant dams slow the Earth's rotation down a bit and put pressure on the ground, squeezing the crust in horizontal or vertical pressures? I don't know if all of them slow the Earth's rotation. Um, but yeah, basically. Um, Delbert Freeman wanted to know about the how of precession affecting climate change, and your opinion was no, and it would balance yes. out. Yeah. Okay, awesome. I think that was that covered all the questions there. So I'm going to shut this down, and then I will start up a new. I'm going to I'm going to have to make a really quick event to get the next one up, and sort okay. of get all that organized. So we're like ten minutes. Okay. Okay. Faster. I'll keep s seven and a half minutes <laughs> okay. of poor grammar. Okay. Okay. See you soon. <laughs> yep. Bye-bye.